Welcome back. It's a distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Lieutenant General Tony Fletcher, who currently serves as the seventh commander of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization Special Operations Headquarters, the Supreme Headquarters, Allied Powers in Belgium. General Fletcher has a very comprehensive special operations career. He's been a team leader, company commander, battalion commander, group commander in special forces, and as a general officer, he's held three high-level general officer positions in Afghanistan, South America, and Fort Bragg. I can't think of a more qualified keynote speaker for this particular uh, forum, and sir, we very much look forward to your comments. Hey, sir, really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thanks. Um, I will argue that there's probably several other guys that are far more qualified to, uh, to, to address this audience today. Um, but given my unique position here as a commander, and uh, I will take advantage of the opportunity to kind of highlight what we're doing here as a part of our support to NATO, and then our relationship that we're building with all of the soft SOCOM commanders um, in the alliance um, to address the issues that we're talking today. Um, so first off, morning to all. Uh, I'd like to say additionally congratulations to a friend of mine, Dr. Ike Wilson, um, for the opportunity and also being, being selected as the president of the university. Um, so congrats, brother. Hey, just for context, um, as we begin this discussion today, um, I've only been the NATO soft commander for only about two months now. I've act actually been in the seat. So I, I preface many of these things I'm going to talk about today just to let you know that many of these initiatives um, and much of the vision is owed to Lieutenant General Retired Eric Wendt and this exceptional team that I happen to be a part of now, which put many of these activities in place prior to my arrival. Um, I just have the incredible luck and good fortune um, to be in a position to operationalize their strategic concept and their approach to en enhancing and enabling um, the soft of NATO um, for the next couple of years. Uh, my intent today really is to, uh, is to make a few points so it can help the audience contextualize where we are, we are currently as a headquarters and then highlight just a few of the initiatives we were working I think that gets after um, the topics we're talking today. As some of you may, may understand already, um, the NATO Alliance is, is currently in the midst of a, what I see as a fundamental shift. It's a shift from a focus on uh, combat operations outside of NATO territory to more um, deterrence and defense at home. Um, for, you know, obviously the past 15 to 20 years, um, it's been reacting to a crisis abroad. Um, but I think as it looks at it, it's itself and the current threats that it faces, um, they want to get more proactively involved in preventing and countering those threats um, at, in, within the homeland. Um, and so I think as a part of this, what you'll see in the next eight months or so, I think NATO, the alliance, is going to deliver its first strategic concept. Um, and that concept is going to chart the way ahead um, not only for today, but for future um, activities, because it's going to define the current and future environment, and then it's going to direct an adaptation of its military forces to address those threats. Now, in the interim, um, from the military instrument of power perspective, um, the SACIR commander um, has already um, given us guidance to direction on what the military should be doing in anticipation of this new strategic concept. And so I'll talk about a few of the things that this headquarters is doing. And, and as I previously mentioned, I would argue that this is the, the biggest um, adaptation of, the, of how NATO approaches its threat since the Cold War. Um, and what you will see is that um, many of the obstacles that, that NATO will face, I think can serve as lessons to all of us as we move forward. One of the obstacles that I, I think and I see within the soft community um, that we're going to face is that it is less about embracing a new concept, but more about stepping away from the current framework. Um, this has been in place 
uh, for several centuries. And so not only take um, the guidance and policy, but I think it'll take a little bit of a shift in the mindset to fully embrace a new concept, which I think gets after um, the emerging threats that, that NATO is going to see and face in the next several years. Because as most of you guys know, over the last 15 to 20 years, NATO, the soft of NATO has been really defined by counterterrorism operations in Afghanistan. Um, and many of those forces um, were, were created in response. And um, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, or a broader conflict against extremist organizations, um, they have deployed, fought, adapted, and grown largely out of a result of those conflicts. So those changes I spoke of about NATO adjusting um, to address um, the, 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 the more prevalent the, threats that we face today um, will serve as a lesson for all of us as we look to modernize, if we look to adapt, and look to counter um, a near peer adversary um, and continue the VEO fight or the terrorist fight at the same time. As a headquarters here, um, I think we're uniquely positioned to help cultivate those initiatives across the Alliance. Um, we serve both as a conduit for developing NATO's doctrine, the policy and guidance, but also the development of their capability um, and their training with the hopes of ensuring that all of the soft of NATO is interoperable, um, which gives us a far greater effect uh, than going at it alone. Um, regarding resiliency and resistance, our approach here has been really to discuss resiliency and, uh, re and resistance in terms of a whole of society effort. And so when we, when we say comprehensive defense, it's really about at times the 98% of NATO um, that's not designated as a part of its, its uh, NATO response force. It's a part of the society, it's a part of all of those first responders um, that are out there that would be brought to bear um, to support not only the nation's resiliency, but also its ability to resist. And one point I need to highlight for the team is that um, um, you'll hear me from time to time shift back before, back and forth between uh, NATO soft and, and the soft of NATO. Um, and I say that primarily because there is no NATO soft prior to a, prior to a crisis. NATO soft only comes together doing, doing an operation brought together on a NATO C2 structure um, in a crisis. So when we talk about uh, conflict below the level of armed conflict, we talk about competition, we're really talking about the soft of our alliance partners. And so it's really how do we in, engage, how do we build capacity, how do we compete before this force is brought under a NATO C2 structure? And so the underlying principle that we live here is really about unity of effort and less about um, C2 or lines of, or, or a line and block chart that dictate um, you have command and control over, over certain, certain forces. And so what we're trying to do is create a mechanism by which there's a seamless transition from peace to conflict um, because we've built those relationships. We, we have the sets and reps and we built some muscle memory of things we're doing in peacetime those structures, those forces are transitioned seamlessly um, through crisis to conflict if called upon. So one of the things I did today in preparation um, to, uh, to speak to, to all of you was I was providing an article by um, our own Dr. Ike Wilson, where he stated, hey, the fourth stage of SOF uh, um, is really a, a comprehensive combination of all the skills, techniques, and operational methods of the preceding ages, which will obviously will be amplified by 21st century technological advances. And as I thought about what Dr. William, Dr. Wilson wrote, um, I, I really started to think this is truly at the heart of the promise that this headquarters is attempting to deliver upon um, for NATO and deliver for all the NATO soft commanders. We know that the lessons learned and interoperability developed over the last 20 years in conflict in Afghanistan, most of those skill sets are, va are valuable and they're extremely fungible and can be leveraged by NATO um, to engage and support alliance efforts um, to confront all of its strategic competitors, um, to deter further aggression, 
and, and ultimately prepare for conflict, conflict should deterrence fail. So, so you may ask today, okay, so what are we, what are we actually doing? And so there's, there's four real initiatives that, that I want to highlight that, that we're doing as a headquarters to get after this problem. Um, we're addressing it from a, uh, from a doctrinal standpoint. Um, we're addressing it from a domain awareness perspective. We're looking at uh, NATO and its force design um, to how best posture the force to respond. And then what we're trying to do is trying to synchronize those effects across the AOR. So I'll, I'll start a little bit with the doctrine aspect. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make fun of myself here for a second. Um, because I'm often confused um, by much of the terminology we attempt to use to define what it is that we're doing. You know, you hear resiliency, you hear um, integrated deterrence, multi-domain operations, active campaigning, hybrid threats, um, activity below armed conflict, competition, systematic advantage. Um, to, be, to be honest, at, at times it, all, it seems to make my head hurt, and I know it confuses many of our partners within the Alliance um, and so what we try to do, and what I'm trying to do through the doctrine aspect um, is, to, is to be more clearly um, and clearly define rather what it is that we expect SOFT to do, what exactly are those activities and how they are linked to a specific outcome. And so we're working hard in the doctrine um, aspect realm to ensure that we're clear, we're concise, but more importantly, we're identifying the exact activities and the desired outcomes um, so it's clear and concise to our partners. And so there's a lot of work underway to ensure that we communicate um, effectively um, across the Alliance, especially in the soft domain. Um, one thing I, I failed to mention early on is that um, here in NATO, um, you know, not only am I the, the commander, but I also am the soft advisor to, the, to SACUR. And in that role, there's an expectation, an actual tasking that this headquarters produces a, um, a soft domain um, strategic plan, which is, which is unique in this role for me. And so broadly speaking, when I talk to the commanders and I try to harness their ideas and their concepts, um, when we talk about um, resiliency, we talk about um, counter hybrid threats, when you talk about active campaigning, the way I talk about the threat is really, I just state simply that this is a threat that inevitably sits below the threshold of a conventional military conflict. And what its, desired, its desires are really to test our resolve um, to, to respond and defend ourselves. Um, these threats, regardless of what name we assign to them, um, is really designed to exploit those seams that exist um, in our existing structures. Because over time, I think our adversaries have learned from how we approach warfare, and they know that there are, at times, obviously, um, gaps and seams between a military response, um, a military a minister of interior response, um, or other aspects of, 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 our, of our structures that may take primacy in a, a certain area, um, there's of, often gaps between pulling the entire team together. And these new hybrid threats, asymmetrical threats, um, the competition that we see are really trying to exploit those seams in our structures. And so as a pillar of, the, of, 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 of our doctrine, um, what you'll see that we, we advocate across the Alliance um, is really comprehensive defense. And, and we see that SOF has a critical role to play um, in this undefined space, whether it's capacity building, military assistance, um, working with other agencies, or simply acting as a conduit connecting different organizations to achieve um, our desired outcomes. And from a broad perspective, um, we, we think that um, the soft that we've developed over the years and worked hand in hand with will leverage many of those expert, those experiences they've had in a counterinsurgency environment um, to help um, our partners um, apply those same skill, skill sets um, against future threats. 
Um, and, and as we move forward, I, I mentioned quickly that, um, you know, one of the roles here of, of uh, as a commander, you know, was that responsibility to write a, a soft domain plan. And so as I, I start to think about preparing and, and being um, and posture to, to give um, SECURE the best military advice that I could, I took a look at the our, our own U.S. global operating model um, in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. Um, and one of the things that jumped out at me is that it, how we define that operating model was, was really built around um, four layers. You know, we speak of a contact layer, a blunt, a surge, and then home defense. And in this strategy, obviously the contact letter was designed to, to complete, compete basically below the level of armed conflict. However, when I, when I shifted and I, and I assumed this position, I looked at the model through a, through a NATO lens. Um, and it was quite evident that, that obviously NATO focuses primarily on crisis and conflict. And so your blunt and surge capacity is really where NATO really focused um, most of its force requirements um, in, in that area. And so we're making the argument that, you know, currently the NATO response force and its, and its approach to defense and deterrence is sub-optimized. Um, we, we feel here at the headquarters that uh, it is essential to defense and deterrence that NATO's contact layer and its homeland defense um, a whole of society, so to speak, has a part to play in the, in the equation. If you want to truly deter, resist, um, and set a posture that can defend and ultimately win in conflict. And we know that successful, uh, being successful in, in, in this space requires 24 seven, 365 persistent kind of combined effort with all the players that have a role to play, which speaks to resiliency um, and resistance. It also takes um, close coordination and interoperability, which once again is, is, is at the heart of what we're trying to do as a headquarters. And so, uh, so, so as we look forward, um, one of the things that we're trying to do, and this speaks to a part of our um, soft domain plan, we're advocating for a new force model. Um, currently, what we do is we build a, a, a special operations component um, as a part of the um, NATO response force, and it goes into a cycle every seven years. So we spend time training, validating, certifying, and we provide this soft headquarters um, to the, the NATO response force. Um, going forward, what we're advocating for is that in lieu of building one SOC headquarters for the uh, NATO response force, we're advocating we must evolve to, to develop capability that has you know, both realistic, geographically orientated soft relationships and structures um, that are creating not only these effects in peacetime, um, but also can be expanded upon by NATO in the later stages of conflict. Um, we think if done right, this will uh, prepare the environment in advance of a potential conflict. Um, it allows you to compete um, in peacetime. Um, and then it sets the stage for success in conflict. Now in NATO doctrine, um, and when we, when we, we use this, these terms, um, we speak of it as, as preconditions for success. And we highlight it as defensive in nature, not offensive in nature, because it, it falls uh, in line with, with, with NATO guidance. So from a soft perspective, um, we're really trying to reshape the approach um, how soft achieves effects across the spectrum, um, both in peacetime um, to conflict. And so we're redesigning what we currently have, having regionally aligned forces, focusing heavily on coordination of information and intelligence and those type of activities, really honing in on it's all about unity of effort, not unity of command. And we're working hard to foster, you know, improved um, bilateral and multilateral synchronization of all soft operations. Um, in the early phases of, of a potential crisis, which ultimately um, will set the stage um, for the Alliance to be postured to respond to Article 5, if ever declared. 
And so one of the things that we're, we're also working hard um, is as the first step of this, you know, I, I had, I was challenged to really have and provide the commander the, the, the soft domain awareness that, that's required to be an effective advisor. Because as it stands right now, I think less than 2%, 3% of all soft activities are visible to the commander um, because it's not tied to NATO. There are national activities. And so what we did within the command, we stood up and are running now what we refer to as a NATO Special Operations Coordination Cell. Um, to gain not only visibility um, and provide soft domain awareness to the commander, but ultimately it allows us to harness these activities in peacetime and their effects and show how that's in support of NATO objectives. Um, whether through STRATCOM or other efforts, um, linking them to other domain activities, um, we, we think that the NATO, our NATO Special Operations Coordination Cell um, is gonna be that center hub um, that allow us to not only see, but to align activities to get the greatest effect um, from all the activities across the alliance that are going on. And right now we don't have that visibility, but we're building out the picture. And this will be kind of a central, um, a foundational piece of, of my engagements, not only with UCOM, but AFRICOM as well. Um, given that the two principal threats um, that SAC year, SHAPE and NATO have called out has been Russia and terrorist groups. And so with this level of visibility, um, we're working to synchronize our efforts both with UCOM and AFRICOM through their theater um, special ops component commanders to address both those threats. And one, additionally, one of the things um, that we're doing in this space to, to help ensure that we're synchronized and harmonized across the entire alliance and, some, and along with our partners, um, we have created what we call a multinational soft advisory team or teams. Um, what I noticed when I arrived here is that there's an incredible amount of activity that, that's occurring daily um, across the alliance. And much of it is bilateral, some of it is multilateral, um, and some of it is it's, it's NATO business. And so what we want to try to do is create this multinational soft advisory teams per location that gives us the ability to harmonize and synchronize um, our soft alliance and partner activities and engagements to ensure that we're not just uh, 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 shooting on the same target, so to speak, but we're actually building institutional capacity for our partners and working toward a common goal um, and not just at the tactical level, because that sometimes be the easiest thing to do, but build institutional capacity and capability for our partners. So, so in closing, uh, hopefully I was able to convey just a little of what um, we are attempting to do as NATO soft headquarters, um, highlight how we, we think this really contributes to resiliency um, of each of our partners, um, how you can see that this, this, this support our efforts toward um, compre de comprehensive defense, um, bringing everyone into um, some sort of synchronization. So we ensure that we're providing the best soft effects that are possible um, and that we're critically thinking about um, the future of soft and how it continues to contribute to the deterrence and defense of the Alliance. Because um, ultimately, I mean, that's our goal, that's our aim. Um, and be partial to counter those global threats that, that we all currently face. Um, hopefully I didn't take too much time and I've left some time for questions and I welcome any questions the audience may have at this time. Over to you, sir. Well, it just so happens we have three questions. One of them coming from a former West Point classmate of yours. And he's asked you to imagine you're giving a, uh, a talk at a West Point class, and the question was about Ukraine. And in a non-classified, unclassified uh, manner, how could you respond to the question, which in the headlines here, about Ukraine, can you add, add some textual content to the situation in Ukraine for, for this class? I think one of the things I mentioned at the very end was this multinational 
um, soft advisory teams that, that we're working toward. Ukraine is actually a prime example of where we're actually engaged today. Um, and to be transparent, um, just three hours ago, I, I had a, uh, an office call, phone call, VTC, with um, the soft commander from Ukraine. Um, and really, it's about an open dialogue. It's, once, it's about developing institutional capacity. It's about situational awareness. Um, and so I think everything that you're seeing, we're seeing as well. Um, and I will tell you that they feel very comfortable where they're at currently um, in addressing this crisis. Um, his, his comments to me, and I'll share with you, is that um, they see this as um, routine craziness from, 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 from some perspectives. They know that it ebbs and flows and there's spikes here and there, um, but they think they're getting the support they need um, from, the, from the Alliance, from their partners, um, from, from all that, that, that support Ukraine in its efforts. And so um, we're actively engaged as far as you know, support and training, um, and we're keeping an eye by, by maintaining open lines of communications with, with, uh, with our, our teammates that are there working hard every day. So the next question comes from a Eurasia Feo, and uh, might be a little contentious, sir, but at UCOM, he worked heavily with NATO and US EMB security cooperation officers, efforts on their logistics security cooperation slash assistance programs to include special operations forces. But his question is, however, we keep repeating the same programs without ever achieving measurable results. So I guess that's a statement and perhaps uh, asking for a response. Um, my first response was I'll blame the last guys. That, that wasn't my doing, so I can't <laughs> take credit for that. Um, but no, but in ser seriousness, seriously, um, I think you will see that problem exists. Um, everywhere because there, there is a huge desire to do what you can. And sometimes it, it, uh, it, it, it is engagement um, that um, if someone has a long view, may not see the same benefit um, that some of our professionals who work within security corporation. Um, but I, but I, as, a, as, as someone who served as a J5, who oversaw a lot of those programs, um, it is because many of our partners also ask for the same stuff over and over because it's what we can deliver and, and we're more than happy to deliver what we can um, based on the needs and requirements that are generated. Um, but there's, there's, a, there's a concerted effort um, that at least from this headquarters that we're taking not to repeat the same level of training because success for, for this headquarters will be how do, we, how do we leverage all of our other members of the Alliance? How do we work ourselves out of a job? How do we build capacity and capability? And how do we build something that's sustainable in each of the, in each of the countries that we're working? And so we're not there yet. It is a tough task. Um, everyone's trying to be responsive to the needs that are coming from their partners. Um, and so I will, I will tell you that, that we we'll just continue to work hard at it. Um, and, and mechanisms where we can get together and share more broadly, um, because as I mentioned, sometimes it's there are bilateral agreements, there are multilateral agreements, but it's but the more we are transparent by our operations, our activities, our investment with each other, um, I think it helps us build a concerted way ahead that produces those results um, that we think are more lasting. And so much work to be done, but I, I do understand the concern and we're working toward um, addressing that through some of our engagements and bringing more people under the tent to ensure that we're all um, working as hard as we can, but more importantly, building something that's from an institutional level as opposed to just conducting more and more tactical training. Over. And sir, my last, uh, last question from the audience is you commented on react, respond, and defend. Could you comment more on proactive mechanisms? That may not be, a, that's the question. So 
I don't know if um, I can interpret that interpret that any better. Proactive. Well, I, I think part of part of this is is a little bit of an education, and then I'll, I'll speak to what I think how we get. At. I tried to broadly touch on that when we talked about um, NATO's um, activities being defined as defensive in nature, because that is the essence of the alliance. That's right. Um, what we're advocating from a soft perspective is that there are many national activities that go on day to day that's in support of a nation's um, defense plan. And so what we want to do is have those be highlighted as well, because although NATO is not leading that effort, it contributes to NATO's ultimate goal. And so NATO, as you know, is really the Article Three aspect of it. It's about you know, you know, self-defense for that nation, it, it owns that requirement. And as you move toward an Article 5, that's when, when NATO actually gets involved and actually provide a NATO response. But in the interim, it is that it's national business uh, of what they're doing to ensure that they're resilient, to ensure that they're ready, to ensure that they're postured in the event it gets to a, to a crisis or conflict. So in the interim, when I talk about getting awareness of what our national soft is doing day to day, um, bringing that not only into the headquarters for visibility, but also identifying the effects they're trying to achieve and then linking those back to broader NATO objectives gives us an opportunity um, to link national activities with NATO activities, which I, in turn, I think will, will, will have a much more active um, um, appearance to it as opposed to waiting for um, an Article 4 or Article 5 trip um, for NATO to get involved. So it's really about aligning ourselves, understanding and harnessing those effects that nations are achieving day to day and, and then using those as part of the platform to build either our exercise programs, our strategic communication and or other effects that they're achieving in support of NATO writ large. Well, sir, thank you so much for taking time from your busy schedule to share your thoughts and understandings with us. I don't think we could have asked for a better keynote for this particular forum. So thank you again from Dr. Wilson and myself and everybody here. Thank you.